A lot of people have fond memories of playing the original Perfect World, a 2005 Eastern fantasy-themed MMORPG from the developers Perfect World Games. A lot of folks refer to this game as generally one of the greats for its time before it was ruined by a steep increase in grinding time in an already grindy game and deplorable pay to win. Thousands of dollars for a Phoenix or Hercules pet? Tens of thousands of dollars for a ranked gear sold in the cash shop? Yeah, we are all trying to forget that happened. Much like its predecessor, Perfect New World is an Eastern fantasy-themed MMORPG with an open world that you'll be able to traverse via mounts or by flying, more of which we'll get into later, with instance dungeons and events. You will be able to choose between four classes at this time, with hopefully more on the way. After you've picked the class of your choice, you can begin designing your character. Character customization was decent, a far cry from what Perfect World offered us before. Seriously, just take a moment and look what you can do with these characters. A lot of the charm, personality, and flair of the individual character identity just wasn't present in this iteration of the game. It really didn't matter which way I moved the sliders for various parts of the body, it really wasn't too much of a difference and made relatively minor impacts on the overall appearance. You can edit your body, which is a nice change in terms of current gen MMOs, but comparatively to its predecessor, the edits weren't too impactful. You can be a little thicker, have thicker thighs, clinch booty, perky booty, slightly bigger breasts or pecs, and thinner or thicker arms, but I mean, that's it. Hair choices are extremely limited and the outfits don't change while you're playing either. It would seem the only way to change an outfit is to either buy one or get one from an event like logging in, which made me a little sad because in Perfect World International, I changed appearance with every new gear piece. Classes as of right now are indeed gender and race locked, and I just lost most of you guys. I'll see you later. Thanks for stopping by. I hope you have a good day, but for those of you that are sticking around to still learn more, the first class, which is Galeblade and the only female class so far, is what I opted to play for the test. She has the ability to spend half the fight in the air if you should so choose and wield swords, including sometimes on her feet when she kicks. Next is Berserker, a tall, fluffy, beefy Tony the Tiger Man who wields a great sword and works very nicely for breaking shields of enemies and spinning around in a circle. The Mystic Sword is a dude who also wields a sword and then finally the newest class added, Dragon Spear. If you couldn't tell, this gentleman brandishes a spear as his weapon and arguably felt the most OP to go up against in PvP to me. And typically they were on the top of the leaderboard, so I mean, they must be good. The combat itself is a type of hybrid. I know they advertise themselves as action combat game, but in truth, you can cycle between enemies with your tab key as well as lock onto them with abilities. This wasn't a bad thing though, especially for my class, which has ranged abilities, but some minor delay in the action of throwing out blades or even dodging to throw out blades towards an enemy. I can't speak for other classes, but there are quite a few skills my class had that locked her in position with no way of getting out of it so I was a sitting duck. This made catching bosses that move around more than I probably do in a week kind of hard to hit. This also played into PvP as well as I'd be animation locked and the dragon spear would just flop down this thing that would freeze me and I'd be CC'd in SWAT. That was fun. While streaming, viewers kept telling me how incredible the combat seemed. Sure, the combat was indeed flashy and beautiful to look at, yet in practice it felt a bit clunky and lacked impact. Viewers also continue to tell me how closely the combat really resembled Swords of Legends Online. And as a former avid player of the game, I can assure you, I can visually see the similarities, but in the act of practice, it is not. I'd say this felt closer to Elyon to me in terms of weightiness of the combat. There were a surprising amount of combos, which meant I could have spent a lot of time in the air or on the ground or both. There were a few different finishers to the combos I could have utilized, and it did feel rather cool to finally get a combo down. Because remembering four left, 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 right, space, left, QE was a bit much for me, but I can see the appeal. People like Black Desert after all. Not that this combat is anything like that, it's just the combos are there, but that's it. That's the only thing that I would say is even remotely Black Desert-ish. I will say this about the combat though, it is actually challenging. You need to watch the bosses and not really so much the mobs, the mobs just kind of like, you can squish them pretty easily. But the bosses, you need to watch them because they do have animation cues. While they don't have that many 
different mechanics to them. They do have some mechanics you need to watch for so you can dodge at the perfect time. And it's just, they, they do move all over, which is, can be fun. I did enjoy it. I did enjoy that aspect of the combat. You'll also have talents that you'll unlock. This will allow you to customize a small amount of your build as each unlocks three choices you can freely alternate between with no additional costs. You'll also be able to upgrade your skills and you can pick and choose which skills you dump your resources into, but it does cost materials, so a little forethought is necessary. Another important part of combat are your spirit beasts, creatures of three elements which are either fire, thunder, or water, and the five animals which are hamster, beast, lion, raptor, and deer, which can be each of the three elements. I know what you're thinking, what did I just listen to? Kakashi doing his water style dragon jutsu? If only. Depending on the animal, it can give you boost to your crit damage and vulnerability for a few seconds, increase max HP, increase combo damage, and more. It also benefits you to have two or three of the animal elemental types equipped as a set bonus. You'll be able to obtain these by collecting summon spirits from either opening chests found in the open world, quests, shops, and battle pass. You will take these summon spirits to various shrines in the area to summon for a specific element over and over and defeat it in battle so you can upgrade your existing spirit beast or obtain it. To obtain higher level spirit beasts, it seems it just comes with the region so you can go from blue level beast to purple as you advance through the story. Also, not only are these spirit beasts useful within battle, they are useful in traversing various dungeons. Not only are there dungeons that can be queued for either solo or with a team of three others, but there are open world dungeons you'll be able to phase into by yourself. Here you'll fight against various mobs to make it to a final boss before purifying the area and allowing little towns to pop up in place of this dungeon. You'll need to typically use your spirit beast to not only cleanse the area, but to move about it with your hooks from your water spirit, explosions from your fire spirit, and time freezes from your thunder spirit. All these things lead you up to clearing another type of dungeon called Mechanopolis's. That's a, that is not a word I typically use in my daily... <laughs> in my daily vocabulary, Mechanopolises, where you'll need to figure out puzzles essentially alongside fights. Spirit Beast can also be translated into PvP from what I can tell, so does gear for at least a 1v1 and duo PvP. These two modes have specific time slots in which they are open, and I can feel some of your guys' eyes rolling right now. Please stop. Your eyes might get stuck like that. No, I'm kidding. They won't. You can keep rolling. It's fine. However, Battle of Rocky Island is open all day, and for the life of me, I couldn't get in. I tried asking in world chat a few times, I sat in queues for hours or more, and I just, I couldn't get in. But guys, I tried. As far as I can tell from the practice version they introduce you to, you'll go in basically into a battle royale. Then there is Stone Forest Treasure Hunt that's only open for two hours every day to go in and kill various wraiths to obtain goodies while fighting other players. You can form teams here and go PK others attempting to gather goods. Most of you are probably waiting for me to tell you there's an open world PvP like Perfect World, but for where the game is currently, that isn't an available feature. The open world is filled with PvE events that are mainly done solo. As I mentioned, there are dungeons out in the open world you can simply phase into, and they typically progress the story to some degree. There is also trials in the open world where you'll kill world bosses, mobs, or rescue NPCs. There are also bounties where you'll phase into instances to kill some beast or kill mobs. If you're wandering around the world aimlessly though, you'll find various events to do like finding exotic beasts to give you materials, chests that have little questions or damage requirements to open, and life skill activities. Then of course, dailies are popping up across the map to acquire various upgrade materials and many other necessary materials for spirit beast and most importantly, reputation. Reputation is key as this will give you currency to finally purchase the next weapon tier. This appeared to be the only way to advance your weapon to a higher level one as far as I can tell as the game just kind of allows you to figure some things out on your own without telling you. That's perfectly fine. Unless they go to the perfect world route and just sell you the highest tier gear in the cash shop. I don't know what's in the cash shop because I can't see the cash shop. I don't... 
I don't know, it's a business tactic that has proven quite lucrative over the last decade, so why change what is so evidently working for them? I will note, though, I see a weapon box located within the battle pass. The store is also, you know, as I mentioned, unavailable for viewing at this juncture, so I have no clue what will be in there on release or future tests. It's, it's whatever. Uh, I can also tell you that the materials offered for the presumed paid portion of the battle pass includes upgrade materials, spirit beasts, and a weapon. These are all things that make you stronger. I would like to note that. If the game is going to be free to play, which is just speculation at this point, they are going to need to make their money somewhere. So go ahead and discuss amongst yourselves if you feel this is pay to win or not, because everyone has their own definition and you can just decide for yourself. Use your use your noggin. You guys, you guys got this. I believe in you. I'm just here to tell you what's there. I suppose to give you guys a better understanding of what the purpose of the upgrading material serves, we first need to discuss gear and how upgrades function. Gear consists of accessories and weapons only. There's no actual armor that you'll be equipping. You'll have a weapon, necklace, belt, two rings, a badge, and a relic. All these things need to be enhanced to increase overall power. If you've ever played BDO, this is like a lighter version of that. I'm sure you'll understand this process, except your gear doesn't de-level or break upon failure. You just lose any enhancing progress you made for the current level the gear is on, and of course the materials you use to get to where you were. You know what, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna let you watch this. So yeah, you can get these enhancing materials through grinding activities out in the world or dungeons or through the battle pass and who knows what'll be in the shop. All of these materials, including awakening materials for the weapon, enhancing materials for accessories, spirit beasts, and skills are going to require a lot of gold, a lot of grinding time, and a lot of luck or a large monthly limit on your credit card. <laughs> you pretty much need to start hitting the ground grinding as soon as you go into the world and get out of the tutorial to keep your gear up with your level. And honestly, even though I felt like I kept my gear upgraded, it felt like I was still hitting for 10 minutes on a basic mob because they are literal damage sponges with HP pools bigger than my jacuzzi tub. So strap in because everything is going to take you a sweet while as a free to play player and some people will enjoy that process and hats off to you. And even if you're grinding, it does seem like there is a limit on how many times you can even run a dungeon for rewards right now. Each one allows you to run it once per day for rewards. The dungeons themselves can be fun if you're running it for the first time. The first dungeon you unlock to do with other people happens around level 22, and there's this one mechanic where you and one other person need to run an electric charge to your pillar. And this takes roughly five minutes of simply running back and forth while you fight mobs if you want to. Honestly, the mobs can be completely ignored, but it felt like a huge waste of time to me. Yeah, there are cool mechanics in there like needing to share the electric charge to get it to a new pillar at the early start of it. That was neat to see the requirement of teamwork, but running back and forth for five minutes wasn't on my top list of awesome dungeon mechanics. Then you reach the end where you fight a boss who has a few mechanics, but overall is just one big HP bar that needs to be whittled down at nothing too abnormal. The second and last dungeon of the test phase I went into though was a hot mess. Literally everything was bugged and they are aware of the bugs, they're, they're working on it, but you know, it's just too funny. I can't, I can't just not mention this. I couldn't climb a ladder and I, I kept getting stuck inside of another player, in particular this one guy. I am so sorry, my dude. And the whole group got stuck together at one point in time and we couldn't fight the boss. And there was no way to reset until we all died. And then we could come back and try to not get grabbed and stuck together. Then we got to the final boss after like an hour because of the bugs. And we were all once more greeted with a large HP pool boss with a couple mechanics. He did have this one mechanic where he did this huge loud charge up and you think, oh shit, I'm about to die. But no, you're just gonna knock down and lose a little bit of HP. Then we thought, well, maybe his loud big charge up needs this mechanic where we throw a minecart at him to stop it. And apparently, no. I don't know what this mechanic is for other than to hilariously hit him in the face. Anybody knows, please let me know. He also had this mechanic where he'd blow you off in 
into the poisonous pit and you just slowly die there because you can't crawl up the ladder because it's bugged. Mm. Overall, that last dungeon, while it was buggy and frustrating as hell, was enjoyable thanks to my teammates. Y'all the real ones. Thanks for the laughs and being patient not leaving the dungeon because you can. There is a leave button, but you guys stayed, so thank you. If all the bugs were removed, it still had some interesting mechanics like dodging minecarts, riding minecarts, needing monsters to explode, and generally interesting mini bosses, even if they were mainly HP pool bosses with weird sounds. Which brings me to the next topic sounds. I think we can all agree sound effects, music, and voice acting really help tie a game together, enthrall you in a world you're existing in, journeying through. This game, generally, has none of that. Their sound effects need a lot of work. Sometimes things are really loud and then really quiet. Music at times is just straight up corny. while other times beautiful. And most interesting of all is the voice acting, which I'll let speak for itself. <laughs> I see you've got what it takes. Come on in. Boy, seems like we have a stubborn one here. Part of me hopes they fix this, and part of me hopes they don't, because quite frankly, it was kind of funny to be in a serious moment and just hear this voice. Uh-oh, it's in the potion box they took away from me. Don't forget to get my potion box back for me from their hideout. I just shipped into the city and beat up my only assistant. Just what am I supposed to do now? Content variety in terms of open world activities is also extremely important for a game, and you probably won't find yourself with an absence of things to do in Perfect New World. Beyond the world dungeons, spirit summons, dailies, exotic beast locations, and world bosses that roam around freely, you have life skills you can level up. You'll have four crafting jobs you can swap between at a cost of gold, but you'll be able to craft in herbology, for potions, for boosts, and heals. Cooking for food with boosts and heals, runes for accessories, and alchemy for other accessories. You can also freely utilize the gathering feature to craft these items. You'll be able to fish, mine, and gather flowers and herbs, all of which require you to level up to gather higher tier items. And of course, you'll need to be able to move around the world to do so. So, which brings me to mounts and flying. There are a variety of mounts you can get from the Battle Pass market and story. Some of the mounts will probably bring back some of the little nostalgia for some of you who played Perfect World. And there are also pets who simply go about gathering up drops, but in all honesty, it felt completely useless because I can pick up the drops 10 times faster than the pets can. They even went as far as providing us epic pets that loot faster than your base pets, and even then, it was super slow. This brings us to flight, a major aspect of Perfect World. Who remembers grinding the monsters from Etherblade or outside the Thousand Streams for hours to acquire that last little bit of XP? Arrow combat was a prominent part of Perfect World that seems to be absent from this iteration. There are a variety of wings that you can obtain, much like its predecessor, that allow you to fly anywhere, so long as you have unlocked the sky tier for the region, which requires a variety of quests and a finishing jumping puzzle of sorts. Once you're able to fly in that region, be aware you do have stamina that needs to be replenished with potions that you can buy from the market or by unlocking more sky tiers and you'll get a few potions for free that way. So yeah, unlike Perfect World, you don't possess unlimited flight, aerial combat, you're required to work to unlock flight in each area, but hey, you can fly anywhere. And by anywhere, I mean I tested these limits. So naturally, I started going around all the map and found out that the testing area of the map was limited by an invisible wall. As a seasoned tester of many games, invisible walls rarely stop me from finding various dumb ways of sneaking out of the safety bumpers. Secret tunnel. Secret tunnel. Essentially, I went into areas they hadn't planned to be open to the public and I began walking because I couldn't fly or mount in these areas because, well, nothing's happened there. I began a grand voyage of around an hour traversing this vast world and found, well, nothing. It seems the test region is still only a small blip on the map. I'm not sure if this was all they have created right now or all we're testing right now. 
but if they do have that much more to do, we're going to be waiting a while for this game. So let's hope this was just what they wanted to test and they have more stuff there. This is an equilibrious test after all, but this is a post-close beta test from seven months ago. I'll be very curious about what the next test phase has to show us as they're still debating on if it'll be a closed or open test. Either which way, I can assure you this map is massive and if they fill it up, we have a lot to do and see. Overall, Perfect New World has a long way to go before it's perfect and it may never even be on its eventual release. The progress that took me all the way to level 40 never really gave me that warm, tingly sensation that I was making great progress with the simple grind for blank material and enhanced gear so you can go hit the other mobs and feel like you're doing no damage difference. So. I hope that's changed. The world is full of stuff to do, grind and see and kill with beautiful areas and cities. Graphically, I mean, even if it's on Unity, is astonishingly gorgeous in areas in my opinion, but the optimization is also something I need to discuss in that same breath. It's terrible. Just end of story, the optimization makes it barely tolerable and I know they're aware of that problem and I know they're working on it. I'm looking forward to the next test if they let me back in to see if it's improved. The combat, as I said before, is just okay. It looks good, but how it actually plays is a weird mixture of floaty in some areas and then clunky in others and being animation locked, especially in a game with PvP, hurts my soul. If they can fix some of these issues, especially with the combat, I think Perfect World will be a game some folks will enjoy thoroughly, especially if they love grindy games. Anyway, tell me what you guys think of Perfect New World down in the comments below, especially after we've discussed it in length. I really hope that Perfect New World continues to work on more of its mechanics and its combat, because I would really like to see a new MMO succeed. And this was Mr. Sticks, logging off for now. Bye!